Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the sun, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. European Central Bank today took the historic step of cutting its deposit rate to minus 0.1%. Its benchmark rate was also lower to 0.15% in an effort to stimulate economic growth in the Eurozone and avoid it spiralling into deflation. Together, the measures will contribute to a return of inflation rates to levels closer to 2%. Inflation expectations for the euro area over the medium to long term continue to be firmly anchored in line with our aim of maintaining inflation rates below but close to 2%. Our economics editor Ed Conway explains the move that's been seen in some quarters as the last chance to save the Eurozone from deflationary disaster. Europe is now entering the weird and wonderful world of negative interest rates. So what has brought the European Central Bank to this? Well, first of all, they want to prevent deflation. Eurozone inflation is well below 2% and nearing negative territory. Second, they need to buoy a stagnant economy. Third, there are rules that prevent ECB from doing Bank of England-style quantitative easing, though they're investigating whether they can do this anyway. All of which is why President Mario Draghi is expected to cut the rate the central bank pays out on deposits held there from zero to minus 0.1%. Now that would mean consumer banks will have to pay to leave money there. Yes. Uh, joining me here in the Gherkin is Tom Crotty, director of the chemicals group INEOS. Tom, thanks very much for joining us here on Sky News. No problem. Now you're the world's fourth biggest chemi chemicals company. You've got a lot of activities mm. in the Eurozone. Just what is it like doing business there right now? It's tough, uh, no question. Uh, I mean, we, our biggest uh, country is in Germany. Uh, it's where most of our business is. Then we have big operations in Belgium, here in the UK. And it's been tough since the downturn. Uh, and global competitiveness is getting worse and making Europe an even more difficult place to do business. <laughs>
Hare, the head of the International Monetary Fund, has warned Britain over its booming housing market. Christine Lagarde urged more building of homes to stabilise prices. As our economics editor Richard Edgar reports, she called for targeted and timely action. The International Monetary Fund flew into town to deliver its annual verdict on the economy. And the darkest cloud the global watchdog spies looming over Britain? Rocketing property prices. So there's a building consensus for important changes to mortgage availability, which could come as soon as later this month. Richard Edgar, ITV News. The visuals of diplomacy were on display on a big screen. President Obama shakes hands. The camera cuts to his Russian rival. (laughs) Then the screen splits, and they know it. A memorable moment on a day to remember. Tim Marshall, Sky News. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ. And will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. 
and you will be hated by all nations because of me. the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time so if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, do not go out, or here he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Imagine, Islamic soldiers force your 10-year-old son to gather wood for a fire. The soldiers pressure him to convert to Islam. When he refuses, he's thrown on the burning wood he collected and left to die. 
They told me I would be released if I became a Muslim. I told them that was not possible. I am a Christian, so they threw me on the fire. Your son escapes, but the scars remain a reminder of his sacrifice. Imagine, your teenage daughter goes to Bible camp. On the second day, the students are attacked. One of the attackers secures her hands behind her back, while another holds a piece of broken glass to her stomach. She's told to deny Christ. I did not answer him, so he pressed the glass harder against me. Do you believe your God can help you? He asked. Dripped with fear, she cries out, Help me, Lord, I do not want to deny you. Imagine, your pastor has refused to register his church with the government. During the service, he's dragged from the church and beaten by the local police. When the officers find a Bible hidden in his shirt, he's beaten with it. After returning home, I felt pain all over my body. It was almost numb at the beginning, but later became so painful that I could not sleep. It is the fifth time he's been arrested. If he's caught again, the police say they will kill him. Every day, thousands of Christians are persecuted for their faith. Hundreds are martyred, about one every three minutes. They're not heroes or statistics. They're family. In over 40 nations around the globe, our family is assaulted for their testimony of Jesus Christ. In most instances, the persecution could have been averted if they had simply denied Christ. But they didn't, and they won't. In Sudan, an Islamic army set on jihad, or holy war, has systematically targeted Christians. Death and suffering can be seen throughout the countryside. Countless Christians are being displaced within their own country. Fleeing from persecution, they've lost everything, often arriving at refugee camps with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. In spite of heavy persecution, the church in Sudan continues growing at astonishing rates. Many of the believers bear the scars of their faith, but they also bear a testimony to God's faithfulness. Over 500 churches have been destroyed in Indonesia. On the island of Ambon, Christians have been massacred in a so-called religious cleansing by radical Muslims. Facing increased persecution, pastors in Jakarta have encouraged their congregations to stand firm, confident that their suffering is a prelude to coming revival. With the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, many have hailed its defeat. But Christians in North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, or China would disagree. Hmong villagers have been imprisoned in Vietnam and Laos after converting to Christianity. Some have had boiling water poured down their throats for simply possessing a Bible in their own language. The Hmong tribe is the largest in Southeast Asia, numbering 10 million. Meeting secretly in homes, more than 2 million have recently committed their lives to Christ. The persecution facing our brothers and sisters is not a human tragedy. It's a spiritual reality facing the body of Christ. We may not be able to stop the attacks, but we can ease their pain. Through prayer, encouragement, and practical assistance, we can fellowship in their suffering. We can show them that they are not forgotten. It's hard to ignore their pain after you hear their cries. <laughs> Well, this is a fascinating story that we've got for you right now. Omar Melendi was a Muslim who hated Israel. But what happened to Omar? Jesus appeared to him in a dream. And after that, Omar became a Christian and started a church in his native Uganda. But his remarkable story doesn't end there. Scott Ross went with Melinda in Israel where he was receiving treatment for severe burns after Muslim extremists threw acid on him. On Christmas Eve 2011, Pastor Umar Melinde was attacked by two Muslims with buckets of acid. The acid ate away his skin, his eye, and his ear. He now wears a special pressure mask 
to aid the healing process. My conversion from Islam and my love and promotion of the love of Israel uh, uh, in my community uh, touched the, uh, the people on the other side to, to haunt me and to hunt me for a kill. Melinda was raised as a Muslim and hated Israel. He knew if he deserted Islam, he could be killed. But he had a dream that changed his life. It was a vision you had or a dream? It's a dream sleeping. I was in the midst of fire crying, but I saw that many of the people who were with me in this fire were the fellow Muslims we go with in the mosque. But as I was crying at, at, at the climax of, a, of the scene, somebody shining stood on the right side and told me that Islam is leading you to this torture. Repent, be born again, you shall survive. Instead of believing in Jesus, Melinda prayed Muslim prayers against bad dreams, but it didn't work. And after that, I went back to my place and the dream came again. The following day, I took myself to the church and uh, I gave my life to Jesus. Melinda became a successful evangelist, winning other Muslims to the Lord. He later founded Gospel Life Church in Kampala, Uganda, where 30% of more than their 1,000 members are ex-Muslims. He also came to love Israel and brought others to visit the Holy Land. Your former friends and your brothers in Islam must have hated you. They hated me. That's the reason. So on the 24th uh, of December, 2011, as I was coming out of my church, somebody pretended as a believer, he said, Pastor, can you help me? He wanted my attention, my full face, yet he had a bucket of acid in his right hand. As I was turning like this, the Spirit of God in me told me, he's a wrong person. So I turned my face to enter my car quickly to drive away. As I was going, approaching my car, he poured a bucket of acid on my head. Oh. So I felt like I'm being thrown into hell. I felt fire from up to down to my toes. And uh, I was like, something is cooking me. And uh, they shouted, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, three times. I realized that I, I have fallen into the ambush of, of Muslim terrorists. Melinda was rushed from one hospital to another, first in Uganda, then in India, and finally Israel. It was a deep, very deep and very severe burn to the face, ear and eye. I spoke with Dr. Joseph Hike, head of the burn center at Sheba Medical Center, Telechomere Hospital. Because it was two weeks old, we had uh, to wait and see that our cleansing was good enough or sufficient. And then in the second stage, uh, we ordered skin substitutes. We uh, reconstructed the face, uh, obviously in association with his own uh, skin grafts. This is a man from Uganda. Mm -hmm. And here we are in Israel. Uh, so why would you take him in here? There's no difference and we do not discriminate between age, race, origin, religion or whatever. This hospital has a big tradition uh, for many years now to help around the world. What is the prognosis now from here on out? Most of the grafting uh, helped and succeeded in 100 percent, but unfortunately we'll need further surgeries. Melindy told me that people need to understand that it takes the power of God to spread the gospel and comes with persecution. So you're not angry with God? I'm not angry with God. It has encouraged me to serve the Lord more, to expose the lies. You see, people say Islam is a peaceful religion. But if you say that Islam is peaceful, look at me. Yes. I am the true picture of what Islam is all about. They, they say there are radical elements and there are good elements, peaceful elements in, in Islam as well. But that's not practical because these radical people, they read what they read from the Quran. And whenever a Muslim does not like something, everywhere in the world people know, they will demonstrate on the street. If not killing ambassadors, they will burn the houses and everything. Melinda says Islam wants to rule the world 
and terrorists take their inspiration from verses in the Quran. This verse says, فَقَتِلْهُمْ حَتَّ لَا تَكُونَ فِتِنَا وَيَكُونَ دِينَ اللَّهِ Which means, kill, fight, and kill those non-Muslims until when there is no any other except the religion of Allah. How do we as Christians, in my case an American Christian from Scotland, um, how do we fight that? How do we defend ourselves against that? Islam is eating the West because the Western world has compromised and sweet talking about uh, what is happening and thinking that keeping quiet will save the situation. <laughs> but you have to remember, hiding your head in a sand cannot chase your enemy who is, who is chasing you to kill you. How do, I, how do I love my enemy? If in, in this case you, you said you love your enemy, they did this to you. The best way to love your enemy, in this case, to love the Muslims, is to preach the gospel of Christ to them. Mm. If we take the gospel to them, at whatever cost, we are loving them. Give us this I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. Now I told you that you have seen me, but will not believe. Everyone whom my father gives me will come to me. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me, because I have come down from heaven to do not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And it is the will of him who sent me that I should not lose any of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them all to life on the last day. For what my father wants is that all who see the Son and believe in him should have eternal life. And I will raise them to life on the last day.